I don't know about you, but I've been swamped by the news, I feel like, and the presidential stuff, which is weighty and heavy and miserable. And um, and then uh, I actually had lunch with a good friend of mine, Gabe, over there. Uh, and um, and we were talking, and um, and we just got on this conversation about, about kind of weight, and, and, it, and it brought a scripture to mind. Um, I want to read it for you. It's Matthew 11. Um, 28 through 30. Oh, my Bible might be getting old. Um, the beginning of Matthew is here if anybody needs it. <laughs> so, we're all getting old, Chris. <laughs> Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I'm gentle and I'm humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A light, easy, humble, gentle God that we serve and follow can lead to a life that looks like that, but oftentimes it feels heavy. And it reminds me a little bit of um, my first Boy Scout camping trip. It was a multiple day hike thing, like go 12 miles every day with a big pack on your on your back, and I was in middle school, and the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared. Be prepared, that's right. So I jammed everything I could possibly imagine that I would need for this multiple <laughs> week journey, or this multiple day journey, uh, into this backpack, and brought it in, and I was so impressed with myself that I could fit it all in there and bring it to this, uh, this thing, and, um, and then I brought it in, and it was prep night. Uh, at the Boy Scout place, and they were going to look over our packs and make sure we had everything that we needed, and I thought, I've definitely got everything I need. Um, I couldn't lift it, mind you, <laughs> but I had everything that I could possibly need. Um, so I, I put it down, and, and the very first thing they did was pull out a scale, and then put your pack on it. And uh, mine came in at about twice as strong as uh, it should have been, and I was twice as weak as I should have been to carry such pack. So um, they start helping me strip things out of it and yank things out of it and saying, you know what, we're going to double this. this. This item can be used for both things, and, and you don't need to bring four pairs of shoes. We, we're going to work with one pair of shoe on, on this adventure. And so um, we just grabbed stuff out of our pack, and, and by the end of it, I was able to put it on my shoulders, and I felt like I could walk with it a little bit, and um, I was ready to journey. And... Um, We've been going through Acts, and well, we're going to be looking at Acts 15 today, and, and as I worked with this passage, it lightened my load. Um, it, it eased my path a little bit in terms of my life and my faith, and so um, I hope that as uh, we dig into it together, that it will do that for you as well. So let me read it. It's Acts 15, 1 through 11, um, and then we'll... Um, maybe dig into the end of the chapter a little bit as well, depending on time. So, Acts 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the customs taught by Moses, you can't be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. And the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. And the news made all the brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done for them. And then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. And after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them and said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you, that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, shows that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinctions between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? 
No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. And the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul talking about the miraculous signs and the wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles the people for himself. It is my, I'm going to jump down to 19. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood, for Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. I know I read more than I said I was going to read, but I just like this chapter so anyways. Um, let's pray. God, um, as we dig into this church controversy, um, I pray that you would take us past just the theological dynamics that within it, but take us into what it means for our lives. Lighten our load, lighten our pack. Help us to recognize what we look like um, from your eyes and that what we are called to be in this world. We love you. Amen. All right, so this is the biggest church controversy of the early church. It's, it's a huge one. It's an important one, and it revolves around this question of how are we saved? What's that, what's that mean? How are we saved? Um, and I find this terminology a little bit weird coming from not being a Christian, but a little bit of my own story was um, when I came to Christ, I was very much saved. Um, not just in some weird theological eternal, now I have the golden ticket that will get me to heaven. But um, God came into my life at a time when I was making a number of choices that were taking me down roads that were, were not life-giving. And he saved me from them, changed my direction, and when I put my faith in him, I, it, it shifted things. Um, saved me from myself. I had a, a attitude and, and a in a way about me that was that was heavy and dark and and sad and um, the Holy Spirit got inside me and now I have that same heavy, dark and sad mixed with some joy and contentment and peace and you're all seeing the working out of those two things battling each other sometimes but the Holy Spirit's at work and um, he empowers me to occasionally bless some, some other people so um, that's what God has done and, and it feels like uh, being saved from some things that uh, I don't know where I'd be without the Lord. Um, but uh, that word being saved, uh, being at peace with God, being um, part of his family, uh, it's a very powerful thing, and it's what we describe how, how Jesus um, saves us. And um, this division was happening, and I know it's around circumcision, which is a weird thing to be focused on, and every time you read circumcision in the New Testament, just add the word works right next to it, or think of it as works, because that's really what was being discussed, is Moses had all the stuff that we have to do in order to be a good Christian. If you want to be a good part of God's family, you have to do all these things, and, and the number one thing that you have to do to have the sign of being a part of God's family is circumcision. So without that, you're not part of the club. Um, and they're saying, well, if they're going to be part of the club, they have got to at least do this one thing. This is the super important thing that everybody's got to do. And you guys are saying these Gentiles can just come into faith without that. Um, why does that matter to us? Circumcision weird. Um, why does that matter to us? Um, it matters because this early church was struggling to figure out, based on what God was doing, how does he actually view us? How does he actually save us? Who are we to God and how are we at peace with him? That's what's on the table, which is a big deal. Um, does he love us and find us and forgive us and invite us to be part of his family um, as we are? Or do we need to get ourselves ready and cleaned up and proper before God can accept us into his midst? That's the question. And the crazy thing is, even though we have gone to Sunday school, some of us, and we, if you've spent time around church, you know the answer to the question of how the gospel works, that it's not a whole bunch of stuff that you do, but that you're accepted by grace through faith. Um, 
We live in a world that does not function like that at all. Um, we go to work, and at work, we are gauged based on how we perform. I was having lunch with a friend of mine, and, and he was describing how um, his company is going to have some cuts coming up. And he said, you know, I'm not too worried about it, because my role in the company, I, I think I provide a lot of value, and it's an important part of the company. And so um, I'm not too worried that the cuts are going to affect me. But in essence, what he was saying is there's this culture here that if you perform, in an important way and provide something valuable to us, we won't get rid of you. That was, that's, that's how business works. Um, and uh, in our relationships, our friendships, we, we meet someone and we say, oh, I'm so-and-so, and then we try to say something impressive or to be likable or to be funny or to be whatever it is that we've used in the past to build some currency with people so that they accept us and like us. Because we're terrified that if they actually met us, they'd say, yeah, not really. You seem like you're made to be friends with someone else, perhaps, but not me. Um, rejection. In the Garden of Eden, it's interesting. Uh, it says that God walked with man. It's this beautiful picture of, of God and, and Adam and Eve, and they're hanging out and they're gardening together, and it's all good. Um, and then sin enters the world, and the very first thing that they do is they hide and then they um, make some clothes for themselves. And ever since that day, um, because of our inadequacies, our insufficiencies, our flaws, um, we hide from one another, and we put on things like how we perform in order to be acceptable to one another and liked. Um, I was having lunch with another friend of mine. By the way, I do have a lot of lunch with people, and if you'd like to have lunch with me, I'd love it. Um, I was having lunch with another friend of mine, and. And I was sharing about just something that I'd been processing in it. I had these great friends at my previous job, and I've tried to maintain those friendships, um, but we no longer have the work in common. And um, so I'm kind of reaching out to them and trying to stay friends with them, and they're not really reaching out back, and I, I feel like there's this gravity that's just pulling them away and that I'm not going to be friends with them soon. And I was saying, I hate losing friends, man. And these are important people. I like them. They're good people to, to have in my life for me, so... Um, and he kind of stopped me, and he looked me right in the eyes, and he said, Chris, I think you're worth being friends with, and I like knowing you, and I don't know why, but it absolutely stopped me in my tracks. Took my breath away, like, and what I think it is, is at the very core of our being, there's this massive thing where we desire to belong, to be accepted, and to be loved with each other and with God. And this council is trying to figure out, does God love us and accept us as we are, or does he need us to perform for him in order to get there? That's the gospel. I've spent a lot of time in church. i spent a lot of time learning about the gospel, doing theology, looking at this stuff, and, and most of us have heard this story, especially if we've been around the church, but I'm going to repeat it for you. Here's the, here's the gospel as you might understand it, and it's missing a piece, and I don't think many of us catch it, but here it is. Um, you're a sinner. You are rotten, broken, You uh, and God is perfect and holy, and uh, he separates himself from sin, and so we needed some help. So God, out of his great love and goodness, came to earth, Jesus Christ, laid down his life to take away our sin so that God could be with us, and then gives us the Holy Spirit so that he can transform us to be more and more like him and fix us. And then we're accepted with God. That's the gospel, right? Now, that's the Western Church. The Eastern Church remembers a very important part, and it's a part of the story that we often forget, which is you're made in the image of God. You carry his personhood. You actually resemble God. You reflect him. And um, because of that, you are infinitely valuable. Every person is infinitely valuable. Black Lives Matter. You've got all these issues around. You've got campaigns talking about who matters and what matters. 
everybody matters, infinitely valuable, because they have the image of God in them. And what that reminds us is the fact that when God talks about saving us, he's not saving us out of his great pity. He's saving us because we're his. We're his kids. We're valuable. As we are. Before we're put together. Before we have it together. Um, you are loved long before you're saved. Not because you do a bunch of things. So the bottom line, um, most of us feel like we're unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to do more in order to get this acceptance. But God says, I save you because I love you, because you're valuable, and your God is to receive it. And there's a lightness in that that strips down so much stuff. Um, and how this works for us in our faith. Um, so we become a Christian, and there's this moment, and I've seen it in, in new Christians' eyes, and I felt it myself when I was a brand new Christian, where we go, oh my gosh, I'm free. I'm alive to God. This is so cool. God loves me. And there's this excitement and this freshness. And then we go to church, and then we figure out that, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be praying more and reading my Bible more, and I, I should be more devoted, and that sin in my life that's not all taken care of, I, man, I've been walking with God a while, I should have that at least solved, and my family should function perfectly, and um, we get this list of Christian stuff that's really good stuff, but we add it to this thing of, I need to be having this if I'm going to really be acceptable to God. I've talked to so many Christians, and I've felt it myself, and their predominant view of what God thinks of them is that he's disappointed in how they're living. Wow! What a weight! It's a tremendous weight. I'm going to read Acts 15, 8 again. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. God, who knows the heart, accepted them. That's the gospel. So, how it works with us is we come up with all these things that, uh, that put us somehow outside the circle of those that God loves, and, and we we say, well, there's grace to get the rest of the distance. But we don't actually receive God's love. Um, but it also works with others. Um, it's so easy for us to be like these, these um, group from the Pharisees who were going, you know, we, we, we like this Jesus thing, but we've dedicated a lot of our life to uh, doing the right thing, and, and you're just letting those guys off the hook. And, uh, and so if they're going to be a Christian, they better be like this. Um, and they're well-meaning, and, and they're, they're saying that God cares about our life, how we live it. He absolutely cares about this, and so it's not just okay to go do whatever you want. They have to do these steps to actually be a Christian. Um, I want to read a, a quote from Matthew Henry. He's a great commentator, um, and he has these little things that he says is, Here's a note, it's a pastoral note, and I want to share one of them with you. It says, there's a strange proneness in us to make our opinion and practice a rule and a law for everybody else. To judge others by our standard and to conclude that because we've done right, everyone is wrong that doesn't do what we do. Um, don't we do that? Don't you feel like you do that sometimes? You, you, have, you go, man, why can't these people just do this? Um, I am a pretty caring, sensitive person, maybe a little bit too much sometimes. Um, I do not do well with people who are callous towards others. And I go, man, how could God be involved in their life if, they, if they're just ripping on other people? Like, what's up with that? And I, and I have a tendency, and I feel it in me to go, I don't want to be with them. <laughs> and i got to take a step back, and, and, and I send out this message that they're not acceptable. 
because they're not caring and sensitive like me. Um, we get our pet issues. Um, I've especially felt it as I watch the dialogue of politics going on. For some odd reason, it's polarized, and especially on like Facebook, where it feels semi-anonymous, and you can post something and then you feel like uh, the the sheer disregard for others that is in the midst of that conversation is amazing. Uh, I'm for Trump, and so I hate all these Clintonites, and uh, I'm anti-Trump, and so I hate all these uh, Trumpites, and uh, I don't even know if that's an ite. <laughs> or we favor the rich, and we go, man, those people over there. Or we favor the poor, and we go, those callous consumers of the world that are disregarding the planet. We, we get our, our pet project, and then we, we draw a circle, and we go, the people in here are like me, and so I will accept them, love them. And the people out here are not like me, and so they're the enemy. Um, I want to draw something, but uh, uh, John, you're a master at this. Do you mind holding this? <laughs> he's he's yeah, done this yeah, before, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. so he knows how to do this stuff. Man of details. You should just throw it up in the middle of the micro past. Okay. <laughs> All right. Put this down for a second. So, the gospel. Here's the circle, and... Here's Jesus, and the people in here are loved and saved um, because they're good people and they're nice. And the people out here are not loved and saved because they are opposed to the same things that uh, Jesus values. So that's how we do it. And we figure out where the circle is and we all build it. I think that this passage is saying something else. Here's Jesus, and here's all of us. And it's like a giant vacuum that God's love pulls us towards his grace. No more circles. We're not allowed to have them. God saves without them. So, thanks, John. That's it. That's it. See you well done. That's a gift. So, are we willing to actually break the circle? Are we willing to go outside the boundaries of what we're comfortable with? To go outside the boundaries of, of maybe what we think are the good people and actually live the love and grace of God out towards them and towards us when we're not within our own little circle of what we think should be right? Um, that's the question. And I want to show you a video. I was at this um, denominational meeting and um, they showed this video that told the story of, um, of the gospel in a really powerful way. So I wanted to share it with you. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come together in your name. I was incarcerated for 22 years. My family all passed away. Uh, I had nowhere to go and no family to come home to. And I applied for housing with uh, Living Water Ministry and uh, they accepted me across the street from the first CIC church here in Grand Rapids. So I uh, immediately contacted Pastor Randy and Pastor Randy said he would love me to come to first CRC. To minister with uh, folks who are dealing with a criminal sexual conviction. Man, that term just jumps up and gets everybody's attention. So it's been interesting in the sense of uh, not looking for this particular type of ministry. It just happened to be in the neighborhood. It happened to be part of the fabric of the community. And they happened to be knocking on the door. When I attended services, it was kind of awe-inspiring. It was, I've seen a body of believers worshiping together and singing together and praying together. And I thought, wow. They asked me my name. They became personal. You know, they reached out and it gave me a sense of belonging, like I have a family. Guys who have spent decades in prison only to walk out renewed, restored, redeemed. And they live out of a profound sense of grace. 
then you see it. And you go, wow. I'll take some of that too. There is a true godly affection that has bonded us together. I really love them. I really love them. And I believe that saying what Jesus said, no greater love than a man has than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's about, that's about sums it up right there. And these people have laid their lives down for me. And so in return, I would do the same for them. It's funny when we, when we start um, drawing the circle, when we start adding stuff to the gospel, we kill grace. We kill it for ourselves. We no longer believe that God could love us as we are, and, and we kill it for others. If that community had um, said, you know what, man, we're just not a place where you can come because of your past, that would have killed that grace that was reaching out towards Michael Cooper. But here's the thing that struck me about that video. Um, did you see how the pastor sort of forgot what grace looks like? until he watched it happen for Michael coming through his doors. You see, the funny thing is when we um, don't live love and grace of God towards others, um, we lose track of it ourselves. And when we do live it out, when we go, you know what? Infinitely valuable person in front of me needs the love of God, and God's shown it to me, so why not show it to them? We find it again we get reminded of how much we're loved. So we have a choice. Um, we can either live this radical love and acceptance, grace, gospel, or we can uh, draw a circle and um, lose track of it altogether. The funny thing is uh, the Judaizers they were, they were trying to draw a line around something that was really important. And looking back, I'm like, of all the things to care about, circumcision, really. That's what you're going to make your church motto, come here, as long as you're circumcised. Like, that's crazy pants. Um, but the funny thing is that if I look through church history, the things that have been really important are bizarre. Do you sprinkle with water or do you immerse with water? That's the line that we need to kill and fight over. And when we look back on our own circle at some point in our lives and go, what were we thinking? Saying that that was them and this is us. It's sort of like looking back at like middle school fashion day things. Like you go look at your pictures from middle school that you dressed up in your, your finest and you go, what was I doing? A neon sweatsuit? Really? I wore that? There's an absolute lightness when you can appreciate people, when you can welcome them, when you can love them, and know they don't have it all together, but then again, neither do I. Even though you might disagree with them on some stuff. But when we hold our rightness, our sense of, of trying to be right and to do right, with great humility, it stops us from judging other people in such a way that we impose what God's doing on us, on them. And we're not very good judges. We're not going to get it right. Um, looking back, we're not going to we're not going to get it right. And and Paul knew this. He was he was writing to these new Christians, and and they were trying to figure out what to do about food. Um, in Romans, I want to read that for you. Romans uh, fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah, Romans fourteen one through three. Here's how he starts that. He says. Uh, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man's whose faith is weak will only eat vegetables. And the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. 
for God has accepted him. The measure of who we accept is who God has accepted. That's our call as a church. That's our call. And we get to apply it to ourselves. And we get to apply it to other people. You have been accepted and loved by God. Can you love and accept others as God loves you? That's Acts 15. That's the bottom of it. Um, I want to close by just sharing how that camping trip that I went on ended up. Um, we, we ended there and I got my pack on and it was a lot of work. Um, but it was an okay journey. Uh, the pack wasn't the worst, worst part of it. There were other kids who um, didn't come to prep night and just showed up with their pack and they got to carry that pack for 60 miles. And um, it was awful heavy sometimes. Um, as we go out of this place, um, we go knowing we're loved and blessed and cared for. And may that lighten your load. May that lift your spirit. May you be able to drop some of the extra stuff that you've been carrying around so you don't have to carry it anymore. And then as you do that, may you be able to drop some of the extra stuff as you look at other people and not carry it against them either. And embrace this lightness and gentleness and love that God has shown. Um, the rest can get worked out. But that's the gospel. Let's pray. God, thanks for loving us. We can never have it together enough to impress you. And yet, uh, you're already impressed with us because we're made in your image and, and you desire to be with us. Thanks for loving us so much. Help us to love others in the same way. And maybe even before that, Lord, help us to love ourselves, to recognize your great love for us, that, that we're valuable to you and that you get to set the value of things and that we are worth being. Lord, your love is an amazing gift and your creation of us is an incredible feat. And so, Lord, may we walk a light path this next week of sharing that love with the world. Amen.